Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And tonight I'm continuing in the study of Christian creeds. And uh, I've already discussed five of them so far. Uh, it's been very interesting studying these creeds. And uh, we, we discussed the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the revised Nicene Creed in Constantinople, and the Chalcedonian Creed, the Athanasian Creed. And uh, now tonight, technically what I'm going to discuss is not really a creed, but they, they are the canons that came out of the Council of Trent, which is, accomplishes the same thing as a creed. It's They're, it's, they're declaring uh, their position on, in this case, on salvation. So, uh, but before I get started here, uh, let me ask Brother Neo to introduce himself. Hey, hey. Brother Neo here. Sorry, I had to fix my microphone. I didn't realize it was shoved back behind my speakers earlier when I was talking to you. I didn't know if it was muffled or something, but now I got it in front of my face. So, uh, yeah, God bless, man. I appreciate the prayers all the time. That's the main thing for me is, is praying for people is the most powerful thing on the planet. And I think that's we, we should exercise that a lot more. And, and trying to understand the Bible together is is the next most powerful thing. And that's what we do every night together almost, yeah. Hmm. Well, amen. Uh, and I guess I, I can mention that uh, that that really is the, the the point of the hangouts that I'm doing here. They call these things hangouts. Uh, that seemed a little bit casual, like people just hanging out talking about random things. But uh, what I'm attempting to do is, is is more structured, but it's but also uh, it's it's limited to those people who hold to the core doctrines of Christianity. Uh, so this is really more of a Bible study and fellowship rather than um, just letting everybody in and argue and debate over all, all kinds of theological questions. So that's how I approach it. And it's uh, because of that, it's much more peaceful and relaxing than some of the, the others you find on YouTube. Uh, all right, let me uh, give a little introduction to this uh, Council of Trent. Uh, I'll read a, a couple of points briefly, and then we'll discuss it. Uh, it says the um, um, the Council of Trent was held between 1545 and 1563. Now that's that's an 18 year period in a place called Trento in Bologna, Italy, um, and it was um, it was one of the Roman Catholic Church's ecumenical councils. Now, an ecumenical council is uh, to differentiate from a, a, a normal council in that regular councils are more local or regional. Ecumenical councils are supposed to be uh, represented by church leaders from the, all over the known world. Uh, the first ecumenical council was the, the Ni uh, Nicene Council. And... So this is another one of those ecumenical councils, and they're getting together to uh, dis discuss certain issues in the church and, and make certain resolutions or what they call canons. Uh, now, let me continue a little further. But that is it interesting uh, that this is an 18-year period that this uh, council went on. Brother, are you aware of that? Yeah, uh, I, I definitely had studied this a little bit. Also, the Council of Nicaea uh, was a big question that was brought up uh, to William Lane Craig, if you know who that is, and uh, a lot of other um, theological uh, guys that are way up there when it comes to, to me. You know, I think they know a lot about this kind of stuff. Uh, somebody went against uh, Frank Turek once and said, you know, what about the Council of Nicaea or the Council of Trent? And he tried to bring it back to that, too. And he was like, well, and he explained everything to him. I'm not going to, like, put words in anybody's mouth. I just want, you know, if you want to uh, explain it. I was, I'm still kind of, like, researching it a little bit. I, I knew about it. I just can't put it into words right now, right this second. Don't don't put me on the spot, man. Don't no, just mess with you. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I do, I get what you're saying. And I get, I think I get where you're going with this, too. But, yeah, I know what you mean. It's it's uh it's definitely a big issue when it comes to a lot of uh, non-believers talking about this kind of stuff too, and it's nice to hear about uh, what actually happened instead of what people 
try to tell you what happened here. Well, it's been uh, probably several months now. I've been doing these studies on uh, early church history, um, uh, uh, church creeds, and I started one last a few days ago on uh, early church heresies, and these these are all intertwined, interlinked uh, topics. But if we examine what happened briefly in the first of these five creeds that I've discussed, it really was. Um, beginning in the second century, uh, going on for several hundred years, they were kind of, everybody was arguing how to explain the deity of Christ, the humanity of Christ, the relationship to the Father and the Holy Spirit. And, and each one of these creeds, these councils and creeds, um, they, they became more and more refined and, and uh, uh, specific, uh, trying to explain the Godhead. Uh, but now, uh, up up until this point here, um, really, they hadn't really made any declarations in these councils about salvation. And to me, there are two things that are most important in Christianity is uh, the person of Jesus Christ and uh, the means of salvation. And the means of salvation through these early centuries in these councils and creeds, it's pretty much either absolutely neglected or misrepresented so that people think that you're saved through water baptism or sacraments. Yeah, that's a big question nowadays too. That's like, how are you saved? And some people even say, and it goes along with the other people that say this, uh, do babies go to hell? And this is where the question comes in is that when they answer the question, because I realize this is Protestant Reformation kind of stuff, like the reformed theology. Yeah. So it, it, they, you know, nobody can really answer that question. I, I think I can't, me personally, I don't think they do. And the Bible says that they don't in a way, you know, that, they, that no child goes to hell in a way, because it's, it's who taught them is responsible for what you, know, you teach your child to go do uh, 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 things, you know, it's like, and stuff like that. And not only that, it's like, there's an age of accountability and stuff like that, like you said. So, I mean, yeah. Well, maybe some point in the future, uh, I can do a, a hangout or a discussion on those topics, age of accountability and children and, and so on. Uh, I ha I've spoken on it briefly in the past in some videos, but that's really not the primary point of this. this oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, no, I get to, I, the only reason I said that was because a lot of times that I ever hear about the Council of Trent is that's what is brought up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Well, the uh, you mentioned the Protestant Reformation, and that brings me right to what I want to talk about next. The the Council of Trent. A lot of people refer to this as the uh, Counter Reformation. Uh, they they had this council and made these decrees, these canons, to counter what had happened in the Protestant Refor Reformation, and uh, and then after this. We're going to, the next study will be on the Westminster Confession, which is kind of the Protestant, uh, at that time, their, their version of the answer to the Council of Trent. But because the, uh, the Protestant Reformation and their, uh, their declaration that uh, we're saved through faith alone, they made a clear uh, declaration about salvation through faith alone and Christ alone. Actually, the, the five solas, sola scriptura, uh, uh, faith, uh, scripture alone, faith alone, in Christ alone, uh, glory alone to God. Uh, I think I forgot one, but uh, the, these five solas were the basic principles that came out of the Reformation, and this Council of Trent is the counter-Reformation to counter this uh, theology that came out of the Reformation. But let me read just a little further here, so and then we can respond to this. It says... Um, um, the, the objectives of this were uh, to condemn the principles of, and doctrines of Protestantism and to clarify the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church on all disputed points. Uh, the second objective was to effect a, reform, a reformation in discipline or administration uh, and then 
third was the church is to declare that this church is the ultimate interpreter of scripture rather than the doctrine of sola scriptura. Uh, the, relation, the fourth point is the relationship of faith and works in salvation was defined to counter Martin Luther's uh, uh, doctrine of justification by faith alone. And then finally, they, uh, they addressed the question of indulgences, saints and relics, the Virgin Mary, sacred uh, music, and so uh, many other things. But I'm not going to really focus on all those things. Primarily, what I want to focus on here tonight is their position on salvation. So let me give you a chance to respond to that before I get into the nuts and bolts of this. Maybe you stepped away there. I'll, come, I'll continue on. No, I'm uh, here. Sorry, sorry. I'm the, uh, my wife was sleeping and she was watching an iPad and it slipped off the edge of the couch and hit her in the head while she was sleeping. <laughs> I had to go try to catch it like Superman before it hit her in the head. I was like, no. I'm, I'm, you made me laugh. I'm sorry I laughed at such a thing. But <laughs> It's so funny though. I was like, no. And then she woke up. I was like, hey, babe, I think it's time to go to bed when the iPad hits you in the head. You know? Yeah. <laughs> we just, I, I heard everything that you were saying. I heard every single word. What I was saying is that uh, uh, the Reformation, that's, that's where it begins, right? Yeah, that's it. And that's exactly what I was saying. So this is a counter-Reformation, or that's what I'm trying to understand. Well, most theologians, uh, let's say uh, church historians, in the past, they referred to the Council of Trent as the Counter Reformation. Their their answer, Roman Catholicism's answer to the Protestant Reformation. Um, some of them now are stepping away from that ter particular term, not calling it the Counter Reformation. Uh, but I think it it is a good description because what happened is you had people leave, leaving Roman Catholicism and declaring their uh, protesting and their independence independence from that, from the Pope, from the Roman doctrines, particularly uh, the doctrine on salvation. And so we, we, we got out of the Reformation some very important things. As I said, uh, sola scriptura, uh, sola fide, which is faith alone, um, uh, Christ, uh, soli Christo, which is in faith alone in Christ alone, um, as, as solo uh, gloria, which is the uh, all the glory to God alone, so that no one can boast. Uh, I don't know why I'm forgetting one, and there's five of them. Um, but uh, those those ideas uh, were uh, part of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, and then the Council of Trent was really its main purpose. I think was to answer that and uh, uh, re rebuke Protestantism. Okay, I'm going to read it just now. I'm going to get into some of their actual canons and see a canon, though. This is something I feel that there's a, a big misunderstanding on when, when the word canon is used. Um, we know that the books in the Bible, there's 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, and those 66 books are we call them the canon of the Bible. What but that's not the only application of the word canon. Uh, canon just means a, 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 you've accepted something as, as valid. And throughout all these church councils, uh, they would basically debate an idea, form a consensus, vote on it kind of, and, and then they'd, uh, it's, it's almost like our Congress and Senate, you know, you present a, you present a bill and you vote on it if it gets passed, it, it become, goes into effect. Well, that's what they, they call a canon. Every one of these issues that I brought up earlier will be presented as a canon or, okay, now we've established this is the position of the church. Uh, so we're going to look at some of their canons right now, some of their, let's say, doctrines or conclusions. Um, uh, the doctrinal acts are as follows. After reaffirming the Nicene constant to, Noble uh, creed, um, 
uh, it, it con looked at the Deuteronomical, deuterocanonical books. So they were discussing which books should be in the Bible. And of course, they came up with additional books. We have 66, but they, they have more that they've approved for Roman Catholicism. Uh, they have a num number of books that we don't accept as canon. And then the next one canon, of course, is the uh, justification. And, and justification means, well, this is how you get justified before God. What does it take to be justified where God declares you as you're just, you're innocent, you're saved? And so uh, it says justification was declared to be offered upon the basis of human cooperation with divine grace as opposed to the Protestant doctrine of passive reception of grace. Um, understanding the Protestant faith alone doctrine to be one of simple human confidence in divine mercy, the council rejected that as vain confidence. Uh, of the Protestants, stating that no one can know who has received the grace of God. Furthermore, the council affirmed against Protestant doctrine that the grace of God can be forfeited through mortal sin. So um, that's the, the primary thing I want to discuss in this Council of Trent and this uh, Roman Catholicism doctrine of how you get saved. And Basically, it just boils down to uh, uh, the Bible tells us we, we get from sola scriptura. In other words, I can read a history of the church. I can, I can read the uh, debates in the councils. I can study all their creeds. I can read all the extra biblical theological uh, books of all these church fathers and historians, and yet I cannot put my faith in any of those things. I put my faith solely in what the scripture says. I will consider outside information, just like, brother, everything you tell me is extra biblical. Everything you say, I'm going to consider it. Maybe I'll learn something from you. But you do not speak the word of God. This is the word of God. So the difference between uh, how I see this and uh, what, let's say, a Roman Catholic or someone who doesn't believe in sola scriptura they think that uh, there is we we can learn doctrines from extra biblical writings and church fathers, and I say no. We need to test all their things by the Bible. So sola scriptura is basically what I'm saying. Um, it's not that I can't learn from a church father. It's not that I can't learn from these creeds. As a matter of fact, uh, the church creeds that I mentioned earlier, they are all making an attempt to explain the Godhead. And they got, each one got more thorough than the next one. And I don't object to any of their, any of their statements about the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, how do we explain all of that and yet have one God? I think they did an excellent job in those creeds. However, they've neglected entirely justification. How do you get justified? So now they're getting around to that because uh, they had for centuries, even though they hadn't uh, declared it in creeds and they hadn't uh, written canons on it in the councils, they had been teaching that salvation comes through baptismal regeneration. You get water baptized and then you, uh, then you have to confess your sins and do penance and then all these things like indulgences uh, uh, entered in and purgatory, all of these false teachings they began uh, to enter the church even in the second and third centuries. It, you didn't have to wait till the sixth, seventh, eighth, tenth, fifteenth centuries for these these false teachings to enter in. So that that was that gives us the need for the Protestant Reformation because it was it was meant to deal with not Christology, not the Godhead, but justification. So now now they come up with their own view of justification, which is not biblical well let me get your answer on all that oh definitely uh, that's something i try to say a lot is that um the law is not a faith is that okay to say the law is not of faith yeah i'm, I'm not sure what you mean by it go ahead and elaborate more okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean in the way that you were saying it is what i'm saying it's like the law is not what gives us faith. Well, 
uh, the, we don't get faith through the law. We don't get justified through the law. We don't get salvation through the law. Uh, but how do we get faith? I, I believe a person uh, makes a free will decision to, to believe or trust Jesus. And, uh, of course, in Calvinism, they would say that we do not make a free will, that we are forced to believe. God makes us a believer, and, and uh, uh, we don't have any choice about it. So that, But that's another subject I'm going to get into on the next study when we get into the Westminster Confession. Yeah, no, I didn't mean Calvinism at all. I was just saying, like, a lot of some of the things that were said uh, during the Council of, um, you know, uh, what we're going through, like, either the Council of Nicaea or the Council of Trent. What I'm saying is that's that's basically where it comes down to is, is that kind of stuff. Uh, in the end, they're, they're trying to say, well, how does the law work? Who makes the law? Do we make the law or does he make the law? Yeah. Well, I, I would say the main, the, the main difference, if I was going to use the simplest terms so that even a little child can understand, is that uh, um, the Bible teaches we're saved because we believe. But Roman Catholicism and uh, some sects of Christianity that are false sects today, uh, they teach that you're saved because you behave. So I say, no, salvation is not based on us behaving. It's based on us believing. We believe the, the good news that salvation is a free gift offered by Jesus Christ to everyone. We receive it as a free gift. It's not based upon our behavior. Yeah, that's a word I use a lot of phrase. It's called walk by faith. You know, you walk by faith. Man. You don't walk by anything else but your faith. Mm -hmm. Well, Scripture says we do walk by faith, not by sight. Um, let me go on. Uh, we'll look at this a little more closely. Uh, their actual uh, positions on this. It says uh, on justification. It says um, justification in Christian theology is God's act of removing the guilt and penalty of sin, while at the same time declaring a sinner righteous through Christ's atoning sacrifice. In Protestantism, right, I would, I would, they're, they're making the point that this is the difference between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, but I'm going to replace the word Protestantism, and I'm going to replace it with in biblical Christianity. In biblical Christianity, righteousness from God is viewed as being credited to the sinner's account through faith alone without works. So, this is and this is not just an argument that is uh, uh, in uh, an argument between Protestants and Catholics today. Uh, I was on a hangout earlier today, and then a few days ago, and a few days ago, it seemed like there these hangouts are happening all the time on YouTube. Oh yeah, they are. You're right. Have, you're having factions of people who are say, "I'm not a Roman Catholic," you know, "I believe in the Bible," and I, I I'm a, I'm a uh, Protestant or I'm Reformed or whatever they, whatever they think, but and yet they're all arguing the Roman Catholic position that salvation is based upon a combination of faith and works. What do you, uh, yeah, what do you think about um, uh, some people that are Orthodox? Well, uh, orthodox means a lot of different things. Uh, uh, if, I, if, if, I, if I'm boxing and I'm leading with my left hand, they say I'm an orthodox boxer. If I'm right, leading with my right hand, I'm a southpaw, I'm non-orthodox. Orthodox just means that you're not doing it, it's not the normal, most common way. And orthodox in Christianity, uh, in, these, in these councils and these creeds, they try to establish what would be orthodox and that's the purpose of writing the creeds. And then, so they state a position, they write their canon, their decree, and then you have to be right within these parameters and what you believe. Now, if you're outside here or outside here, then you have to be either exiled or excommunicated because you're not what they call orthodox. But I think you're using the word orthodox in the sense where rather than the Roman Catholic um, of, orthodox, yeah, the, I mean like Greek, yeah. Eastern, the Eastern Orthodox Church. Yes, that's exactly what I mean here. Yeah. Okay, so in their case, um, uh, 
there wasn't a whole lot of difference in in, in the Eastern Orthodox or Greek Orthodox. Uh, the, those um, the the Byzantine uh, side of the church compared to the Roman side of the church, there wasn't a whole lot of difference. I mean, they watered or they they argued about Christology, and uh, that's why these creeds were written. And but they pretty much were in agreement for the most part on Christology and the Godhead. Uh, but when it came to salvation, I don't really see much of a difference except the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox, they don't have a Pope. Uh, and they uh, they also, they, um, um, but, but they still have the viewpoint that sacraments are part of salvation. Uh, a series of sacraments, you've got uh, water baptism, you've got confession, communion, confirmation, I think uh, marriage, there's one more, and then there's the last rites. There's always one that I forget. Um, but so I don't really see much of a difference. To me, what I want to ask each person is just this simple question. Uh, what's required to get saved? And if, if they say that uh, trusting Jesus is all that's required, uh, and works are not required to get saved, then it's okay, whether regardless of what they call themselves. But if they're truly holding to Roman Catholic doctrine or truly holding to uh, Eastern or Greek Orthodox doctrine, they wouldn't be they wouldn't be able to make that declarative. They, they couldn't say it's just faith alone. Um, do you anything else before we, we move on? No, no, that's good. I, that's what I wanted to hear about. The Council of Trent is what I was going for. Yeah, the way they were talking about that stuff was. Uh, you know, the, the, basically, I wanted to get down to those two points. It's like, what do they believe? Well, they were solidifying these rules, and I hear you. I gotta go change a diaper, but I can still hear you on my phone. Uh, just, just, uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. Uh, what were they? They were saying that, or they were saying, yeah, you know what I mean. Go out. Okay, and talk here's, to your here, here's a little link that that is actually right. Ask, answering your question, and let's see if my, my explanation coincides with this. It says, the Eastern Orthodox Church, officially the Orthodox Catholic Church, also referred to as the Orthodox Church, Eastern Orthodoxy, or Orthodoxy, is the second largest Christian church in the world, with an estimated 225 to 300 million adherents. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church is one of the oldest religion institutions in the world, teaching that it is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church established by Jesus Christ in his great commission to the apostles and practicing what is under, it understands to be the original faith passed down from the apostles. However, uh, let's see what it says about salvation for them. Uh, theology, Trinit uh, Trinitarianism, it says that, uh, okay, Christian life, mother and God and saints, eschatology, Bible, holy traditions. I'm not seeing their position on, let me see probably have, would be listed under sin, salvation, and incarnation. Um, all right. Well, I'm not finding what I need to find in here, but I'll, I'll just leave it with, with what I've said, that uh, I don't believe the Eastern Orthodox uh, belief system is sola fide, uh, but there may be individuals who believe in sola fide, faith alone for salvation. Um, but just like there were individuals who uh, could be parts of uh, Protestantism or Roman Catholicism that, that have their own particular views on these things, um, not everybody that falls under that umbrella uh, has exactly the same doctrines. Uh, let me go further now back. Back to the other page here, it says, um, um, now let's look at uh, faith alone, the concept of that is sole fide is Christian theological doctrine that distinguishes most Protestant denominations from Catholicism. 
Uh, the doctrine of sola fide or by faith alone asserts God's pardon for guilty sinners is granted to and received through faith alone, excluding all works. Um, that's, that's what we find throughout the whole Bible. And that's kind of the argument that I see going on here on YouTube every single day. And I, I could, um, I'll give you one verse off the top of my head, but I could give easily give you a hundred verses like this. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, those two verses there state very clearly that we're, uh, it says, For by grace are we saved. That means that because God is gracious, we can be saved. Grace, being gracious means that he's being extraordinarily kind to us beyond what we, we deserve. Uh, for by grace are we saved. Saved means that um, we're spared condemnation. We, we're not condemned and we are not uh, sentenced to the second death in the lake of fire. We're saved from that. For by grace are we saved through faith. Faith means uh, that you are believing in something or, or believing on something. The Bible says... Uh, we're saved if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that means that we depend on Jesus. We rely on Jesus for our salvation. We're not thinking that something else is needed. There's something else I must do. I'm just going to depend completely on him. We're believing in Jesus for salvation, and that just simply means that we believe in his ability to save us. Nobody else can save me but Jesus. He's the one that solely has the ability to give me life everlasting. And I'm also believing in the faithfulness of Jesus. And that is the fact that he promises he's going to give me eternal life in heaven if I'll trust him. And because he's God, he can't break a promise. So, uh, so I believe in his ability and his faithfulness to save me. So for by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So in other words, this is not based upon you, what you do. It's a gift salvation now some people will try to twist this and say that the gift it's referring to is faith but if you just look at basic grammar and how it's written it couldn't possibly be uh faith it's referring to the gift in the in this verse here references to the subject of the sentence which is salvation for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god salvation is a gift from god and a gift is something that uh, you just receive. You don't have to work to earn it. You don't have to get in your wallet and reach in there and pay for it and buy it. Uh, it's it's offered to you freely with no strings attached. Someone else bought it for you. Jesus Christ bought it with his blood, suffering, and death on the cross. And uh, so he did all the work. He, he made the full payment, and then he offers us as a gift. So far by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. So in this verse here, we see that salvation comes by grace through faith, um, uh, and it's not by works. It's a gift. I got to go. Uh, there's emergency power. Um, I'm going through a big storm uh, up here. That uh, We're on emergency power. I got to call yeah, it's, you. It's in, all, it's in all the news channels. I hope you get through it okay. Bless you, brother. All right. Bless you, too. Goodbye. Okay, Okay, so in, the, in this one little verse here, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says we're saved by grace through faith. Uh, it's a gift from God, not because we worked for it, so that we can never go and boast about it. Now, if, if you could get to heaven because of your own working at it, then you could go around boasting that I worked hard enough and I got it. You could even go up before God at the judgment and say, Say um, and he says, "Why should I let you into heaven?" And you could you could appeal to God and say, "Well, I did a lot of work. I don't you think I earned it? I worked really hard. I I got baptized. I went to confession and communion, and uh, I gave to charity, and I did all these works. And uh, I think I deserve it." Well, you're boasting before God. So, but that verse says, "Lest any man should boast," and that gets to the question, the the subject of sola gracia. Sola Gracia means, I mean, Sola Gloria. Sola Gloria means all the glory 
goes solely to God. Jesus deserves all the glory. He's the one that bought it for us. He's the one that suffered and died and paid for our sins, and he offers it to you freely. Doesn't he get all the glory that way? If you were working for it and earning it, you could claim the glory for yourself. So uh, now that's just one example of a hundred verses I could give you. I've got plenty of videos that, that defend uh, salvation by faith alone and argues against uh, lordship or work salvation. So you're free to watch all of those. Uh, so the main thing I want you to get out of this study here is that uh, in Roman Catholicism at the Council of Trent, they were reacting to what happened um, in the Protestant Reformation, primarily started by uh, Martin Luther and then many others, uh, and they, they left Romanism, they protested its false teachings, and they started teaching the five solas and that salvation is through great, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So that, uh, that Protestant Reformation uh, drew a, a line in the sand and said, they believe you're, you're saved because of works, we believe you're saved because of grace and faith, and that was the primary distinction. Even though there's a hundred other things about Roman Catholicism that we could argue against, and if you want to learn more about that, watch my playlist, Roman Catholicism Debunked, and uh, you'll see, understand the history of Roman Catholicism, the heresies, and the horrors, uh, the horrors of their, their history. Uh, so, let me see. So that was the, the they were had this Council of Trent to answer what happened in the Protestant Reformation. And they also declared that um, they would have more books in the Bible than, than the 66 that we have. Uh, and they also, uh, they also declared that, uh, uh, justification is in faith by faith alone is just vain confidence and that uh, they said though no uh, there must be passive re reception I mean sorry there must be a, a, a cooperation between the your um, grace and works they have to work together uh, but that's not what we learn in the Bible as I gave cited in that example of Ephesians 2 8 and 9 Now, they, they came up with uh, quite a few other uh, decrees or canons at the Council of uh, Trent, but that's really not what I want to focus on and everything else they declared. The main thing I wanted to emphasize in this study is that uh, what, what we have here written by the prophets and the apostles is what we should be relying upon. After the apostles... and had written these books uh, in the New Testament. And, and after they had all been martyred and finally all died away, the last one being the Apostle John, by the end of the first century, then beginning in the second and third and fourth centuries, the people that, that uh, followed the apostles, commonly called the church fathers, uh, and then the generations after that, they started all teaching their understanding of all these things. But unfortunately, um, the concept of justification through works creep, creeped in very early. And they started um, inserting the, the, the requirements of water baptism and sacraments and, and, and good works. And that, that what we learned in the Bible was not enough faith in Jesus is not enough, and they added all these other things. And it, it didn't take long for biblical Christianity to become something else. Uh, so um, it became necessary uh, in the 16th century, we had the Reformation, and they said, we're leaving that because we've read the Bible now. When people got access to the Bible, they started seeing that uh, 
what the Bible says is contrary to what we've been learning in the church. So that was really what it was all about. And, and the argument was, should you believe solely in the scriptures and, and make your that the test for your beliefs? Or should you believe in the traditions of the church fathers and all the early theologians? And so that was a primary difference too. And that was one of the canons that a sola scriptura was wrong. And that's still true today by the Roman Catholic Church. They're teaching that you cannot trust the scriptures. Uh, you must have it interpreted to you by the church, by the Roman Catholic Church. Um, now, this sets me up for the final uh, study on these church creeds, and I'll do that next time. And that's when I'm going to look at the Westminster Confession. Now, it's called a confession. <clears throat> it's kind of a, like an essay on uh, the be beliefs uh, in, the, in the Reformation. Um, and it's, it's not written as a creed. It's more written like an essay. It's quite lengthy. So we won't read it entirely, but we'll look at the main tenets of it next time. And then you'll be able to see that even though uh, it espouses salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, uh, we have some other problems that have, were crept in and are presented in this uh, Westminster Confession. So I'll get into that next time, and then that will be the conclusion of the study of these church creeds. Now let me just end this broadcast tonight with a short message about salvation. I've talked enough about it so you understand now that um, the Bible says we're not saved because of the religious works we do. We're saved simply because of our faith in Jesus. And that's the decision you've got to make if you want to go to heaven. You've got to reject your own merit as, as the means of salvation. See, the problem is most of the people in the world today, even, even in, in most of the churches you, you will enter today, and for this matter, for all of the world history, almost everybody has believed the, a lie from the devil. And that is that to go to heaven, it's determined by personal merit. The good people get to go to heaven. If you're not good enough, you go to hell. So uh, you've got to reject that. The Bible tells us that's not God's way. That's invented by the devil in the Garden of Eden. But uh, if you were to try to get to heaven through your own religious works, the standard you would have to meet is perfection because that's what the Bible says, that, that uh, uh, you have this level here called God's glory. And it says we all fall short of the glory of God. So here's this the level you're going to have to attain, but no nobody in the world has ever attained that except Jesus Christ. He set the standard of perfection. So if you can be as good as Jesus, which is perfect, which means you've never done one thing wrong your whole life, you've never even had one bad thought your whole life. If you can do that, then you don't need Jesus Christ. You can just go to appeal to God and, and say, I'm perfect and I deserve heaven. But if you're not confident in, in, in that, and if you're willing to reject that, now you can understand your need to be saved. And the only Savior is Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, when he says, I'm the way, he, he says, I'm the way to get into heaven. Uh, and he even said, he's the only way to get into heaven. And then he says, I, I am the truth. Well, what I'm telling you today about believing in Jesus, that's the truth you need to believe if you want to go to heaven. And he says, I am the life. That means he's the life giver. He's the sole source of eternal life. And uh, so you, you need to reject religious works, personal merit as the way to heaven, and instead embrace Jesus for your salvation. It's kind of like this icon right here. It's a picture of Jesus reaching out to you and saying, I will take you to heaven if you trust me. Will you trust him? If you trust him, he says, he says, uh, no one can pluck you out of my hand. I will never leave you or forsake you. So 
once you put your faith in Jesus, you never have to worry about not going to heaven. You're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven because the Bible says uh, Jesus is God and God cannot lie. God cannot break a promise. Jesus' promises, all of us, he'll get you to heaven if you just trust him. So it's a guarantee. And that's why I'm so happy every day. I'm confident I'm going to go to heaven because I'm trusting Jesus. And so I want you to know who he is and what he's done for you. The Bible says Jesus is eternal God Almighty who came down from heaven. He was manifest in the flesh, became a man, the son of God, Jesus Christ. And Jesus said the reason he came down from heaven was so that he could give his life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone free. Jesus gave his life as he suffered and died on the cross to set you free from condemnation. When he died on the cross, all of our sins were put on Jesus Christ. Jesus paid for all of our sins. You should say, thank you, Jesus, right now. He died on that cross and he was buried. But he also raised himself back to life bodily on the third day. And he promised he would do that too. He, he, he did it several times, but in one way he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And they said, how can you raise up the temple in Jerusalem? It took 40 years to build it and you're gonna raise it up in three days? But it says he was not talking about the temple in Jerusalem. He was talking about his body, his death, burial and resurrection. He promised that he would raise himself back to life as a sign to prove that his claims were true. And his claims were he's God, he's savior, he has the power over life and death. And it's that bodily resurrection that gives me confidence that my faith in him is justified. And I know he is resurrected because uh, he walked among 500 witnesses for 40 days. They saw him, they talked to him, they ate with him, they touched him. And it's that resurrection that is the proof that if you trust Jesus, you're guaranteed you're gonna to go to heaven. So put your faith in him now. And if you do, make a note, make a comment on this video, let me know. And join me nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific, for more of these Bible talks with Brother Luke. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.